Um, welcome to everyone and thank you, Chris, and thank you, Pip and Angela, for joining us um, for this. Um, this. We're so excited. We think this is absolutely wonderful. You've come into our land room. Um, I do. I've made a lovely display, which you actually can't see. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little bit out of, yeah, so there we go. Um, and all the people who have come on board, uh, we're very appreciative. So on behalf of the Island Story Gatherers Committee, I'd like to acknowledge the Bunurong people, the traditional custodians of the land um, the Island Story Gatherers are meeting on tonight, the land called Malau or Phillip Island. We pay our respects to the Bunurong elders past and present and to emerging leaders. We extend a very warm welcome to Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islanders who may be joining us for this event tonight. I also encourage those of you listening in other locations to acknowledge the local Aboriginal custodians of the land you are listening from. So um, I think just without a further ado, um, I, well, I, I just want to thank my committee. Um, this is our fourth digital event um, and without their enthusiasm and support, they wouldn't happen. Thank you to the Best Coast Shire Council who have been so supportive of our little projects that we get involved in. And, um, and just all those people that um, come along. And as you can see, we've got quite a few and, and I think there's just a few more to come as well. So I'm handing over to you, Chris, you can take it away. Thanks, Lois. Um, for anyone joining us on Zoom for this event, um, uh, if you've not, if you're not familiar with Zoom, um, you'll see if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a chat function. And um, if you click on the chat function, then it pops up with a little window to the right, and you can type in your um, your questions there. Now, normally with these sort of events, we take questions at the end, um, but I don't mind if someone asks a question about something that we are discussing and they want to put, stick it in there, we can maybe throw to it if I see it um, during the actual event. So it's up to yourselves to whether you want to ask a question during the event or um, coming up to the end. Um, we're going for about an hour, so you'll have plenty of time to ask questions. Let me introduce uh, I'm, myself. I'm Chris Flynn. Um, I'm a member of the Island Story Gatherers Committee here on Phillip Island, and um, I'm author of a couple of books. My latest one, um, you can probably see it if I point my finger up like this. It's just on a little stand behind me. That's more of a, my latest one is Mammoth. There you go. Um, and tonight we're talking with Angela Savage and Pip Williams. Here are their latest books. We're talking about Mother of Pearl and the Dictionary of Lost Things. Now, um, Angela, let's start with her. She's an award-winning Melbourne writer. She's lived and travelled extensively in Asia. Um, back in 2004, her debut novel, Behind the Night Bazaar, won the Victorian Premier's Literary Award for an unpublished manuscript. Um, most of those books have gone on to become you know, huge international successes, so it's um, amazing that Angela won that. She's, won a, she's written a bunch of uh, crime novels and she was shortlisted for the Ned Kelly Award. Um, she's taught writing. She's got a PhD in creative writing and her latest book is Mother of Pearl. Angela, until today, was the director of Writers Victoria, <laughs> but um, she has, today was her last day. She's got a new job and she'll tell us a little bit about that later. So everyone, please welcome Angela Savage. Virtual hand clap. <laughs> um, <laughs> Our other guest is Pip Williams, who's coming to us from um, the Adelaide Hills tonight, from some kind of uh, stone hut, I think, that she lives in there, hence the, <laughs> hence the yellow background. Pip was born in London, but she grew up in Sydney, lives in Adelaide Hills. She co-authored a book called Time Bomb, Work, Rest and Play in Australia Today. Uh, back in 2017, um, she wrote one, Indi one Italian summer, I nearly said one Indian summer, <laughs> that's the sequel. Um, one, or it's a memoir of her family's travels. Um, you've probably heard of her latest book, The Dictionary of Lost Words. Um, as far as I know, it's the best-selling Australian fiction title of the year by quite some way. Um, it will be published in dozens of countries and translated into loads of languages. 
It's been a huge sleeper hit. Um, and we're stoked that she's with us tonight. So please welcome Pip Williams. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us, guys. Um, this is going to be fun. The way we usually start these things, I suppose, at real life events is I don't like, I don't, I really like to get authors reading from their books because, you know, you can read the book yourself rather than just waste, you know, 10 minutes listening to someone read. So we're not, we're not going to do that. But I do want to hear from both of you um, about what you think the books are about, which is kind of an interesting thing to ask an author because sometimes it's quite different to what everyone else thinks it's about. And um, both of these books, we're going to talk a little bit about language, the history of language, and um, how it reflects uh, women's lives. So interesting to hear what you think, how you describe these books. We'll go into a bit more detail about some of the issues um, later on, but let's um, start with a, an, an author's own um, honest description of what the books are about. Let's start with you, Pip. What is your book about? Actually, Chris, I think that's such a lovely question because the way you phrased it the first time, what do you think your book is about? Because mm. what I think my book is about, I have realised over the last few months, is sometimes different to what readers think my book is about. And it's made me think about writing, actually, because um, I think once you've published the book, it's 90% done. And then the last 10% of the book is really up to the reader. And um, I've found that fascinating. And your question speaks to that, I suppose, because I would say that my book is about, um, it's about does language represent women's lives as much as it represents men's lives? Because our language has been defined and written down in the historical record by men using resources uh, and texts that have mostly been written by men. So the Oxford English Dictionary is what my book is about. Um, and the Oxford English Dictionary is based on uh, written text. So a word didn't get into the dictionary and still doesn't unless it's written down. And because this dictionary was, and I say this because it's, it's sitting here, um, this is A and B, <laughs> and this is the first edition, but um, it was written back in Victorian times when most of the literature that they referred to was written by men. And so I just had this simple question, do words mean different things to men and women? And if they do, what does that mean for the language that we speak today? But when I've been, um, I've had some correspondence from readers, and that's why I'm really excited to have uh, this discussion with Angela, I've had so many women contact me and say that this book is all about motherhood. Um, mm -hmm. And other people, men have contacted me and said, this is a book about a father-daughter relationship. And I find it really interesting um, how a book is finished off by the reader. But for me, it was about the meaning of language. <laughs> And what about you, Ange? What is your book about? What do you think your book's about? Well, uh, yeah, I also love the question, Chris, and I love that answer from Pip as well. Um, and I would, I would suggest, Pip, that it's even more than 10% of the book that's yeah. written by the reader, you know, in, in so many respects. Uh, what we put out into the world is, is really just a set of possibilities that readers then put together can make the connections to their own lives in their mind. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some of us, some of us actively um, endeavour to create those connections by the way we write and the kinds of um, threads we leave, you know, uh, left untied mm -hmm. uh, and the spaces we leave in the text. Um, funnily enough, in answering your question, Chris, about what do I think this book is about, there's a little bit of a meme going around on Twitter at the moment where writers are asking each other, um, what are recurring, three recurring themes in your work? And it's a great kind of way of distilling what it is that motivates your writing across all books. And the ones I came up with, which I think apply to this book, are strong independent women with secret regrets, uh, gaps and bridges between cultures, and moral ambiguities. And um, I don't think anyone would actually say that, it would off the cuff would say that Mother of Pearl is about those things. I would probably say that Mother of Pearl is about international surrogacy between Australia and Thailand. 
um, because that's what the kind of plot device is. But the underpinning themes and ideas are those other things that, that kind of have driven a lot of my um, creative fiction all along. Also, um, I'm also interested in cultural outliers and, uh, you know, outsiders also. Do you think we have a tendency to just write the same book again and again? <laughs> um, I'd like to think that we have a prism that we shift, shift and we look at perhaps the same themes, but in a different light and an ever changing light. I had to think I had the same, I'd had to even think I had the same fixed ideas on any of those themes from one book to the next. There's some uh, potentially thorny topics discussed in both of these books. And I've been rubbing my hands together, <laughs> wanting to get into this. And I should probably say for everyone watching now that tonight um, there's an R rating uh, associated with this, uh, the Zoom Excellent. event. I think I know what um, that means you're going to say. <laughs> as, as we get into the filthy language in Pip's disgusting book. Um, <laughs> I, I, this is a great topic, I think. Um, but we'll get on to what Pip's um, problems or maybe and, and ironies in, in talking about this book um, she's encountered in, in a minute. But Angela, we'll stick with you for a minute. Um, talk, talking about surrogacy, which is not something I've seen very much of in fiction. Um, and there's a lot of, can you tell us a little bit about the sensitivities and the pitfalls surrounding that issue? Oh, how long have you got, Chris? <laughs> um, do you want me to talk about them in literature or in reality? It's a, it's, a, it's a moral, legal, ethical, medical minefield, to be honest. And it's a classic um, example of an area uh, where our capacity to do things has outstripped our, um, our legal systems and our ethical mm. frameworks. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're always catching up. Um, with the technology. But it's also complicated by the fact that it's um, controlled by a huge industry, a very powerful uh, medical technological industry, which fails most of the people who enter into it. It's, it has about a 30% hit rate. Um, that is about 30% of people who go through IVF um, end up with a live birth at the end of it. And then that, that, uh, that figure is probably comparable for surrogacy. And there's a whole lot of reasons why that is. It has a lot to do, you know, surrogacy is never anyone's first choice of how to become a parent. It's usually their last choice, uh, their last option. Um, and just to, to kind of put some definitions around it, surrogacy is traditionally, traditional surrogacy is when a woman is impregnated or um, has her eggs fertilized and carries a baby to term for someone else. Um, gestational surrogacy is when the woman gestates the, the, the fetus or the baby, but um, that uh, IVF has come together with donor gametes. So the woman, strictly speaking, doesn't have a biological relationship to the child, although I would argue that carrying a child for nine months does create a biological relationship. But it's again, that's one of the kind of areas that's an example of real murkiness. Um, so it's, it's, it is extremely complicated um, and this book came about largely as a result of my dissatisfaction with the academic and media kind of accounts of surrogacy, which were very polarised and polarising. Um, and I felt that fiction gave me a freedom and a space to explore some of those moral ambiguities. And in fact, I, I think I called my, the it, it was, it, this book was the topic of my PhD in creative writing. And I think I called the thesis shifting territory because especially during the period of researching it, I felt that every time I, kind of thought, yep, this is what I think about surrogacy, then something else would change and I'd go, no, 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 this is what I think about surrogacy. And yeah, so that, I th and, and people have said, one of the things I like about the book is that I don't tell them what to think about the issue. Um, I was, yeah, sorry, Angela, to interrupt. Yeah. I was just going to say, when you were saying, this is what I think about surrogacy. No, this is what I think. That's, that's how your book as a reader um, made me think as well, because you, you know, the book um, is really, uh, you really skillfully um, navigate that minefield that you were talking about. And it makes me as a reader constantly question um, my preconceived ideas or ideas that I've developed because of my woke, <laughs> um, you know, background or whatever. And um, I realise how, how um, little I have in, engaged in many aspects of 
of the um of the question if if you know what i mean and your mm. your book mm. does that really well thank you thank mm. you that was definitely my hope i like oh, that yeah. people I come just, to the i, I like the, yeah i love that people I'm come to the end and say i don't know what i think about this and i yeah. don't know what you think about this and that's exactly where you want to come to um, cause the last thing you want to do is write something didactic that's hitting the reader over the head with what you think they th should think. Yeah. Oh, and beautifully, I think by the end of it, um, what I thought has changed, but also become more gray. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, I think that's just the sign of a really good book is that it, it sort of stays with you in a personal way. Thank you. Thank mm. you. I'll get Pip um, to talk about my book in future, Chris. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about your book, Pip, and the fact that when I first heard about this book, of course, it was someone told me about it. And word of mouth has been a key sort of selling um, method of selling this book and, and getting, getting it out there. And I picked it up and I thought, I haven't heard much about this. It hasn't, there hasn't been much about it in the media. That's funny. Why is it why is it selling so well when there's there hasn't been very much media? And then I read it and I thought, oh, of course, this is going to be very problematic. Can you can you tell us what problems and ironies you've encountered in trying to talk about this book? Yeah, so I mean, on the, it, you know, there is a there is an easy way to talk about it. Um, but the the thing is some of the most interesting parts of the book. Uh, if I want to talk about it, 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 like you said, it then has an R rating, which I didn't even think about with the very first kind of online Zoom because I published this book on the 31st of March. And of course, that was a week after everybody went into lockdown. So everything that had been planned was cancelled. Um, and the first thing I did was a Zoom event with Dimix and naively, I didn't think twice about what I could say or not say on a, a Zoom event. And, <laughs> and it wasn't until afterwards I realised what I'd done. But there, there is a part of the book um, and a, one of the probably more colourful characters who is a, um, her name's Mabel and she's, um, she's an ex-prostitute and she has a stall at the covered market in Oxford. And my character, Esme, who is collecting women's words, uh, befriends Mabel. And Mabel basically has a filthy mouth. So she, you know, a lot of the words that she introduces Esme to um, are words that in the dictionary, first of all, were excluded because they were considered vulgar. Um, and there are many words that are in the dictionary, which are then uh, given that kind of judgment that, you know, we're told that they're not to be used in polite company. And that's a quote, you know, not used in polite company or vulgar or, you know, these are some of the judgments that are in the first um, edition of the Oxford English Dictionary. Am I allowed to swear on this particular um, Yes, you event? are. You can say <laughs> that. Yeah, I didn't ask that to the mix. I didn't <laughs> straight ahead and, and told the anecdote. So one of the first words that Esme comes across is the word cunt. And cunt is a really old English word. And, and it should have been in the first Oxford English Dictionary because it ticked every single criteria for inclusion. It's, it's old. It has multiple examples of usage in text and Chaucer for instance is someone who used it quite liberally um, but in fact it was uh, used back in the 12th century um, it was actually the name of a street so it comes from a street in London uh, which is called Grope Cunt Street um, and this was at a time when uh, streets were named for their economic activity so I will wow. leave it to your imagination okay. wow. to yeah. um, work out what was what happened in this street and just put grope and cunt together and you've you've got it. You'd have um, to think it wasn't a sought after address, Pip, would you? <laughs> you wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> but some of the premises were well frequented. Um, and so this was the earliest example um, that they can find of that word. Um, but then Chaucer used it quite liberally. And the thing about the word cunt, I love saying it, by the way, so forgive me <laughs> if, I, if I repeat it. Um, 
The thing about the word is that, in fact, in those early centuries, it wasn't vulgar. It was simply a euphemism. Um, and it became vulgar over time. It became an insult over time. So, you know, back when Chaucer used it, I don't think it was an insult. It was simply a euphemism. Um, and, and so leaving it out of the dictionary leaves out a history. It leaves out um, so much, not just the word. Um, it, it means that we don't have access to the history of that word and the history of the people who used it. Um, and so in a way, that's why I included it in my book, because I was interested in how and why uh, words are included or excluded from the dictionary. Um, and that was such a lovely example of... And, it was, and those examples, those conversations with Mabel gave me some of the best laugh out loud moments of reading your book. They yes. are just glorious. Yes. And, um, and I must thank, I must thank my partner, Shannon. Uh, Chris, we were talking earlier about his family coming from Ireland. So he, he is the one that uh, told me that particular limerick that, uh, <laughs> that Mabel uses to provide evidence Fantastic. for the word. <laughs> Can I also point out that I also make liberal use of the word cunt in my novel, but I do it in Thai, so no ah. one can tell. But there is actually an exchange in the, in the story, and it, it goes to the heart of what you're saying, Pip, where a doctor says to the Thai woman who is the surrogate, um, gives her an instruction about um, a, a medicine she's supposed to insert into her, you know, and he uses a medical terminology which she can't understand and she sort of looks blankly and the nurse kind of, who comes from rural Thailand, nudges her and says, shove it up your cunt, girl, you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that's, it's an example of how power, you know, language is used to divide and rule, divide and conquer. Yeah, and I think but the... Truth, the interesting thing about that example and my example is that um, this this word that was simply a euphemism, it was simply slang for vagina and um, and that's how it used to be used. But then it is turned into an insult. Um, mm. You know, it's turned into something vulgar. And to make the association between um, something vulgar, something that is vulgar or a person who is distasteful or vulgar because it is usually used to describe a person, and part of a woman's anatomy is mm. problematic. Mm. You know, this and it was, it, in, in the Thai case too, and, and the word actually translates literally as, um, as clamshell, um, yeah. you know, or oyster, oyster shell. It's got that kind of association. It's also very um, class-based. So yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's considered low class, um, yeah. a word that, that low class people would use, much like, you know, Mabel in the way that Mabel's characterised. I mean, she's got that terrible little shop with, you know, not much worth selling and, uh, yeah, fabulous yeah. character. But actually, Angela, you raised something else that, um, because I didn't understand the tie, I didn't, I didn't know um, necessarily what word you were using. But that's the other, the other thing that I found interesting in doing the research for the book and, and writing it, is realising that so many of the words that were left out um, and even some of the words that were put in, but then given a judgment about mm. being vulgar, um, are words that the working class would use. They're mm. wor words that lower classes, working classes would use, which in and of itself says something about our history and, and who we think um, has the right to define mm. language. Mm, um, and we now call it slang, and we have a whole lot of slang dictionaries, but but why are these words that are used every day and more often than the original just not words? <laughs> why are they not just part of the vernacular mm -hmm. is, is in some ways, I think, the question when, you th when you're thinking about gender and class bias, I think slang is a really interesting thing to consider. Mm, absolutely. Mm. Do you think that the fear of the of the female body is also linked to and um, the um the way that throughout history language has been used to describe the female body and female sexuality and pregnancy and motherhood it's sort of considered to be uh, you know i just get this impression that even today there's still a bit of uh sense and fear around that language um if i can respond to that there's actually one of the things i found really interesting in researching surrogacy is the incredible linguistic 
kind of gymnastics involved <laughs> of the different parties. You know, people, uh, and, and, and they're very contested. So, you know, there are people who use a term like gestational surrogate. And in fact, I think I remember Nicole Kidman getting absolutely slammed in the media when she thanked the gestational carrier who, um, who carried their second, her second child with Keith Urban. Um, and, you know, the, the, the kind of the radical anti, you know, the abolitionists around surrogacy would insist on calling that person the birth mother, for example. So, so you know, you've got those two polarities of gestational car carrier, which is very much kind of clinical and a description of a task or a job and um, birth mother, which has all kinds of different connotations, much more emotion involved, much more a sense of kinship and a sense of engagement. So, you know, within that, it's highly contested on, in itself. Um, and then you layer that with the Thai uh, language around motherhood and I was fascinated, around surrogacy rather, and I was fascinated to learn early on that the Thai words for surrogate mother, trans me or un bum, means un bun, I should say, translates literally as the mother who carries merit. And this is seen as a merit meritorious act um, in a kind of Buddhist philosophy that to have a child for someone else um, is a gift. And traditionally in village society, if you had a sister who couldn't have children and you had plenty of children, you would give one of your children to a sister to raise. Um, so it's interesting because in other countries, surrogacy, like in the commercial industry in India was kind of known as dirty work. Um, so you've got, a, you know, a lot of, even within that, you've got a lot of cultural variations on what's going on. And I think, but I think all of that speaks to what you're talking about, Chris, in terms of um, the ambivalence we have around motherhood, the ambivalence we have around relationships, bodies, science, all of those kinds of things, um, warring it out in this kind of linguistic, uh, you know, I had to, I had to actually, at the beginning of my thesis say, I'm, I'm aware of all the language contestations. I'm choosing to use these terms. I know they're not definitive. And uh, I noticed that the parliamentary inquiry that happened while I was doing my research did the same thing. It's like, ooh, you know, if we use one lot of terms, it's like we're aligning ourselves with one camp. Um, so we have to somehow accommodate all these different, this different terminology in order to avoid being seen to come down for, against, mm. uh, indifferent, you know, that kind of thing. I, and I, I think actually, Angela, that's so fascinating because it's such a demonstration of um, how political words can be. Absolutely. And, meanings, and, and also how um, very different they can be in different cultures and for different people. And depending on what word you use does align you. It tells everybody who you are, what you're... Um, views on something might be and and so on and um, kind of so knowing the ins and outs of the different meanings and understandings of things makes a huge difference I think for me reading your book um, understanding Maud's idea of this this notion of merit that you're talking about was completely new to me you know it was culturally it was cultural information I I had never come across before and it made a huge difference to um, how I then thought about surrogacy and and what it might mean and it also made me think how in a way how um i, I suppose um thoughtless how 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 white and western i'd been in my thinking having not tried to understand it in a way from another cultural perspective um, and I think both of our books, in, in fact, ask those sorts of questions is if you if you look at something from a different angle, what will you start to think? How will you assess the language and, and also the behaviour and situations that we mm. find ourselves in? Mm. I, I wanted to make a comment about um, how that might apply in, in your case, but I don't know about spoilers, <laughs> Pip. I might leave you to, to kind of direct how far you take some of those conversations. Yeah. Well, I think, I think everyone yeah. in Australia has read Pip's book, let's face it. So there's, there's no such thing as a spoiler for this book. <laughs> well, I, that's the interesting thing I said earlier about um, I've, had a, I've had some really beautiful emails. I'm not on social media, so I, I don't get too much. But every now and then people, people find my email address and send me a beautiful email about um, what the book might have meant to them. And I've had a, a few from women who have either... Um, experienced uh, giving up a child for adoption 
or have been adopted um, because there is that theme is, is in my book. Um, and this is when I said, for some people, the whole book is about motherhood. And it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I, I wrote about a woman at a particular time and things happened to her and I sort of went along with what I thought would happen at that particular time. But I realise actually that there is this strong theme of motherhood all the way through. And um, like your book, Angela, it's asking a question in a way. Um, and that question is, what does it mean to be a mother? Mm. And in fact, that's a, that's a question that comes up um, mm. around the de definition of mother mm. in the original Oxford English Dictionary. Mm. What does it mean to be a mother? Because you can be a, a, the biological birth mother of a child. Mm. You can be an adopted mother, but mm. you can be the everyday mother mm. of, of a child. And in, in my book, Esme is, um, her mother died in childbirth. Um, and so she's raised by her father. And there are a number of women around her who take on the role of, of mother in various ways. Mm. Sometimes it's a, in a way, it's a patchwork of, of mothers that she yes. has looking after her, everyone kind of dealing with a different aspect of what perhaps her, her mother might have dealt with. Um, but it's a really interesting thing. And that didn't come, come about by design. That sure. came about accidentally and engaging just with the history and the character and, and what was going on, which I think is interesting as well, because I didn't think about it at all until after I'd finished the book. I think it, I think it spoke volumes for me about kinship about the notion of kinship. Mm. And um, I remember the American writer, Sarah Santilli saying that kinship is, what defines kin is someone for whom we put all our resources behind nurturing. And I just thought it was a beautiful definition. And I feel that that's what happens to Esme in, in your story. And it's a really beautiful story about kinship. And it does, um, it does, unfixed to use a bit of an academic word um uh the notion of family and and i think that was also a theme that i wanted to explore because so much of surrogacy almost reifies those biogenetic relationships particularly along patriarchal lines so you know in in the vast majority of cases um because surrogacy is something that older women tend to go into um, at a time when their eggs ain't so good and they get a lot of pressure from IVF doctors to use donor eggs, but the child will have a, a biological relationship with, uh, with the father. Um, and of course, in, in queer relationships, the child will only ever have a biological relationship with one partner. So it does, uh, you know, it, it calls into question in the way that, I think in parallel ways that your book does. And when you were talking earlier, this is where I said I didn't want to, um, didn't want to introduce any spoilers, but I think that the way that motherhood gets qualified in language is really interesting too. Mm. When people get called an adoptive mother or when reference is made to adoptive children, adopted children. I don't know a single time, and I'm mentioning Nicole Kidman again, I don't know why, but, um, <laughs> but you know, uh, her adopted children with Tom Cruise, I've never heard them called her children. Yeah. They've, always, they've always been that qualification. And I find those uses of language really interesting too in terms of what they say about um, how legitimate uh, or you know how legitimate parenting parenthood is constructed linguistically mm. I find that really fascinating and I, I thought your book did this beautiful beautiful thing and I won't talk about that scene because partly it will make me cry and partly because it is a bit of a spoiler but there's this exquisite scene that I felt recognized the breadth of what it means to be mothered and and what a, a mother is, and I just love that. And it's right towards the end. You can probably think of the scene that I'm talking about, but I'm so. just encouraging everyone out there to read it. <laughs> Do you both think that language is, um, is still employed as a reductive um, means of, uh, of trying to understand women, and even in the publishing industry, perhaps, uh, or even amongst readers who... Do you think women are often portrayed... Um, like to me, women in books are often portrayed as very two-dimensional, you know, classic wives, mothers, and whores. And um, it's, it, that's why I love these books so much because that's, it's, it's totally not that at all. It's, it's, it's so much more than that. And I wonder why we don't see that more often. I don't, I don't know about 
literature, I think literature is probably expanding these days, but I think it's still happening, happening politically and in the news mm. cycle. So um, one of the, one of the um, things that I talk about in, in my book, simply because it was happening at the same time as, as the development of the Oxford English Dictionary is the suffrage, uh, women's suffrage movement. Um, and at the time that I was writing this book, the women's suffrage movement um, started to include suffragettes. So the word suffragette is a really interesting word because we tend to use it these days as an umbrella term for women who were fighting for the right to vote. But in fact, it was originally coined by newspaper men um, to put down the women who were becoming militant and um, so the first, uh, the first time the word suffragette was used, it was in 1906, and it was in tabloid newspapers written by male tabloid <laughs> reporters. And they, they coined this term suffragette because the ending E-T-T-E indicates that something is smaller than or less important than the original. If you think of kitchenette, you know, cigarette, all of those endings actually just say it's smaller than or less important. Diminutive, isn't it? Yes, yeah, diminutive. And, and they were using it to put these women down, the women who were starting to become militant. Um, and in fact, at the time, suffragettes really just belonged to Emmeline Pankhurst's um, WSPU, whereas the, the other organisations, they definitely did not call themselves suffragettes. They were still suffragists and and many of them didn't um, didn't agree with the methods of the suffragettes. But that word became, that has changed uh, because Emmeline Pankhurst decided she'd start a journal and she called it the suffragettes. So she she basically claimed that word for her for her own and and gave it the connotations we now give it. But at the time, the newspaper men who were using the term were using all sorts of um, other put downs about these women. So they were calling them the screeching, husbandless, childless, um, you know, um, women. They were using terms that indicated that these women were not real women because they weren't at home, they weren't under the control of their husbands. Um, they weren't mothering properly. Um, and also uh, a lot of references to mental illness. They were crazy in some way. And I, I can't help but um, then draw this parallel to the way politicians and newspaper men and shock jocks talk about young women like um, uh, Greta Thunberg, for instance, who are protesting around climate change. They are also being put down um, and, and told that they're little girls acting up, essentially. Um, it, they are, we are being told that these are young women who have mental health issues and their fathers and parents should be um, taking care of them and not letting them um, be the subject of, of news reports and public attention. And so exactly the same thing is happening these days um, with exactly the same kinds of, of people. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about, um, I was doing some research recently for a project about uh, Greek myths and the origin of Greek myths and, mm -hmm. and how um, a lot of the creatures of Greek myth were, the monsters were often female. Yes. And um, and some of those words have been used to even today as an insult. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we all remember during the build-up to the American election in 2016 when Hillary Clinton was repeatedly called a harpy. Mm -hmm. And um, if you Google Hillary Clinton harpy, which I did, there's 185,000 <laughs> 185, hits for that. Or Julia Gillard being called a witch. Yeah. You know, yeah. that... So that it's, it's interesting how language is still used today as a means to, to insult and, and reduce women to something. I was, just, uh, I was just looking at my bookshelves to see if I still had my copy of the Lost Goddesses of Pre-Hellenic Myth that I could lend you, Chris, which, uh, <laughs> which actually goes to show how all the uh, Greek myths are actually derived from and bastardised versions of pre-Hellenic goddess worshipping cult stories <laughs> so there you go <laughs> um, 
I like the idea of the suffrage movement, though, um, sort of having a bit of a link to your book, Ange, where uh, I couldn't help thinking when I was, you know, comparing the books, you know, did Esme's involvement in the rights of women, did that make uh, Anna's dream possible 100 years later, you know? Yeah, right. Interesting. Yes, because Anna is someone who has chosen not to conform um, to societal expectations of, of, um, of roles. You know, she's someone who has prioritised her work life. She spent more than a decade working in, uh, as an aid worker in Southeast Asia. Um, she has a tendency towards righteousness, <laughs> um, but she, I think her heart's in the right place. And she also gets to a really interesting point in her career where she starts to question a lot of the assumptions that she's made and the value of what she's done. And I think that that's probably what prevents her from being completely unbearable as a character. Um, <laughs> and there are a couple of things. I have, a, I, Anna and I share a bit of a CV. Um, I didn't spend quite as long in Southeast Asia as, as she did. And I don't speak Thai as fluently as she did, but there are a couple of things that happen in the book, which are directly, um, taken from, from things that I experienced working in Southeast Asia in, in the field of HIV uh, in particular in the, in the 90s. And, um, and then that was, in a way, there were stories that I wanted to be in literature somewhere. Um, and, you know, the lovely thing is that uh, two of my friends who worked on a particular project, a rural women's development project with me in Laos, actually recognised the project in the book. They're like, page 83, I know that story. I remember that village, that trip we did to those villages. Um, so there was something kind of special about preserving some of that in the story. And it is about the sorts of story, the sorts of women's stories that don't make it into literature yet. I'm still hoping for the next generation of Lao writers to come and shine a light on those lives in a, in a, in a more vivid way um, than I can possibly do. Um, but the other story that, that is in there that's kind of true um, is the moment when Anna, uh, who's been working on HIV for a long time, reads a report that's been put together by the United Nations that's kind of done a 15 year review of um, HIV programs in the region and concludes that actually a whole lot of people have been on, on the wrong track. Um, you know, that AIDS isn't everybody's business, that there's actually groups of people for whom HIV is a much higher risk for a whole lot of reasons to do with behaviour. And so, and that really throws Anna into um, some turmoil where she questions the value of a whole lot of things that she's done in, with her life and the decisions she's made. And I guess that's what I was saying before about strong and independent women who have sec who harbour secret regrets. I think uh, that, that it's not about um, suggesting that by not following those expectations, societal expectations, that there's um, regret, but there is, um, it's, it's, very, it's still very difficult, I think, for women to make those decisions. I don't think societally we support those women as well. I think those women are still subject to questions about how many children you have or whether you have children or why you don't have children, the assumptions that are kind of made about that, the childlessness, you know, we saw, um, Julia Gillard attacked for that as well. Um, so yes, I think there are some degrees to which we've come a long way and others where there's, you know, it's a constant um, one step forward, two steps back <laughs> for women, particularly at the moment in Australia, uh, you know, and particularly at this COVID moment where we've seen such huge impacts of the pandemic on women's lives, um, both domestic and professional, and yet virtually no response that takes that gendered experience of the pandemic into account. Well, very little. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot of news um, articles about that, but so what? Like, yeah. where does it but go from there? The policy, it's just, yeah, where's yeah. the policy response? That's right. right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, having a book published, this is a bit of an, an author's question, I guess. Um, having a book published, it's a weird experience, eh? Because you spend years, literally years, sometimes without much feedback or much interaction with others working on something. It's akin to entering the unknown when the book comes out. Um, can you both maybe tell us about how long it took you to write these books and how did you cope this time round? And how have you found the response? Because there's that, obviously that weird moment when you've kind of finished, as you mentioned, Pep, earlier, and then it goes out in the world and sort of gets finished out in the world and people tell you what it's about and you read reviews where you think, huh, 
I didn't realize that's what I was doing. <laughs> how have you both found it this time? Pip, you um, start, because I'd love to know how long it took you to write your book. Uh, actually, it didn't take as long as I would have thought. So I was actually, um, after I finished writing my memoir, One Italian Summer, the conclusion I came to at the end of that is that I wanted to, to write. And I, I started writing a different type of novel. Um, and then I had this opportunity because I was going to the UK because I have a lot of family over there and I wanted to do a writing um, retreat while I was over there. And I'd already written 20,000 words of this other novel, but I had been thinking about the Dictionary of Lost Words and it's been called that right from the very beginning. I'd been thinking about it because I'd read Simon Winchester's um, The Surgeon of Crowthorn and that's mm. what made me think of it. And I because that's a non-fiction account of, of the dictionary to some extent. And I found it fascinating. It's a wonderful book, but it did, it did plant this seed and this question about whether words mean different things to men and women. And I hadn't decided necessarily on writing a book about it. I was just curious about it. And then when I realised I was going to the UK, I thought, oh, actually, there is this other book that I want to write. But to be honest, I didn't think I was capable of it. Um, I had never written fiction. Um, I wrote my memoir in a way as a, an apprenticeship for creative writing because I'd been an academic for a very long time. And it, it takes a while to stop writing like an academic um, and nobody would be interesting, interested in writing anything I wrote if I wrote the way I did 10 years ago. Um, and so the, the memoir was like a, an apprenticeship, but I didn't think I had it in me to write this novel because it was a big novel in a way. It was tackling big themes. There was a history that I wanted to sort of honour. Um, and I thought it would be better if I write a smaller novel first. But it just kept bothering me. And then I was going to the UK and it made sense to work on the English novel rather than the Australian novel, which is, is the other one. Um, and so I, I had written a thousand words of it before I went to the UK and, and that was in uh, at late 2017. And it just flowed from there. It was once I got started, I was so interested in the topic. Um, I absolutely loved doing the research. Um, I don't research and then write. I, I sort of do them both at the same time. I tend to just write. And if I need to find something out, out I do the research. But there was a, a wonderful period of immersion in Oxford and in the archives of the Oxford University Press and with the actual slips and proofs of the dictionary um, it was just such a wonderful experience. And I think because I enjoyed it so much, two years later, I, I had a good draft, which I sent off to the publisher. So, and it was published very quickly after that. So, you know, it was, um, yeah, so it was about two years. It's funny to hear you say that you didn't feel that you were capable of doing it because, um, that's an experience some strands can identify with that. And I had that same feeling about mammoth where I actually thought, oh, I'm not going to write this until I'm much older because yeah. there's no way I'll, I'll be good enough yet to tackle it, but it just tackled me and I had no choice but to do it. And it's interesting you, that you struggle with that because the dictionary of lost words is one of those books that is now a touchstone for me. So whenever um, younger writers, you know, ask me about, you know, reading their manuscripts, uh, I'll often say, well, have you read this? Because that's what you're up against and, um, and you, need to, you need to bring your game because this is the sort of book that's, um, that people are reading. So it's an example I use now as um, oh. this, is, this is the kind of good stuff that you need to be doing. <laughs> oh, what about, wow, Chris, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ange? How did you find doing this one? Well, this was a um, this was a change of pace for me because, as you pointed out, you know, I'd started out as a crime writer and I'd written mm. three crime novels in my Jane Keeney series, which is set in Thailand. Um, and I had no qualms about being a crime writer. I didn't realise when I set out that I was so naive. I had I had not studied writing in any formal way. I'd come to writing as a reader, as a lover of of books. Um, and you know, when I started to encounter 
counter a bit of genre snobbism, I was sort of a bit shocked. Um, I mean, you know, there's a problem being a crime writer. Um, and I personally, you know, some of my best friends are crime writers. <laughs> I love <laughs> reading crime fiction. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastically supportive community, I might add. But I guess as a writer, I wanted to extend myself and try something a little different. And enrolling in a PhD gave me the opportunity to do that in a supportive space um, with a scholarship that, that meant, I, spent, I felt like I'd spent, to write my first three books, I'd spent 10 years fitting writing around paid work and being able to enrol in a PhD and get a scholarship was a way of reversing that where I could fit paid work around writing um, for, for this you know, rarefied period of about three and a half years. So that's what I did. Um, I wrote the book in that period. Mind you, I also wrote an exegesis, which is that nasty, unfortunate bit that has to go alongside a creative project when you, uh, when you produce your creative project as part of a PhD. Um, you know, I pulled it off in the end, but I, I think it's fair to say I don't find the same joy in academic writing as I do in writing fiction. Um, and then it was probably another 12 months after that before it found a publisher, during which time I changed the ending a little bit. Um, it's funny, I, I, my, the examiner's reports came back and usually the examiners focus pretty much on the academic piece, but they both did comment on the novel and one loved the ending and the other felt really cynical about it, <laughs> which is sort of proof that you can't please all the people all the time. But there was a particular um, scene and I'd always had a niggling feeling about it um, right at the end. And I went back to my Thai friend who was sort of my um, sensitivity reader, I think it's now called, but she was my kind of informal cultural advisor. And I went back to her and said, mm, see this scene, do you think it would really happen like this or would it really happen like that? And she went, uh, like that um, and that was very that was that was a good experience to go through and it was also it created um, a scene that a lot of readers have also come back to me and said they found that scene really confronting and so I was really glad that I had changed it because um, it was a, it was a moment that sort of desentimentalizes um, some of the relationships in the book. Um, anyway I know I'm a bit off topic Chris but yeah look round about three and a half years to write round about 12 months to after that to get it published and actually pretty light on the editing by the end of it but I wanted to pick up on your point about when you feel old enough to write or experienced enough as a writer mm. to write a particular story because um, one of the things I took great heart from was the author's note in Barbara Kingsolver's um, The Poisonwood Bible which is one of my top five favorite books um, and she says um, this was the book I set out to write when I became a writer, but it, but I felt like I needed my apprenticeship to get to the point where I could write that book. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think it's bad either to give writers that message, you know, writing like any other is a craft. Um, it doesn't surprise me to learn that Pip had written a memoir and had come from an academic writing background, but I agree with you that it's an absolutely outstanding fictional debut. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's magnificent. And I have yet to recommend it to anyone who hasn't loved it. Um, but I also, I think for most of us mere mortals, um, we do, uh, we do, you know, a, a writing's a craft like any other. We do get better at it with practice and we get better mm. at it with study and we get better at it by reading great examples um, and, and learning from those examples as well. I mean, I have so to that say that I'm, I'm an ex, you know, director of writer centre, but I happen to believe it. <laughs> So is that it for you now? You're, you're no longer a crime writer? Oh, oh never say never. <laughs> um, you know, some, sometimes I go to a new location and my imagination just starts scattering it with dead bodies. I can't help that. I think that's just a kind of impulse. Um, what about you? You've written, you could, you could call your first novel a crime novel. Do you ever get yeah. tempted? Um, occasionally, but um, I get scared of... Uh, I get scared of genres where there are so many examples of it because how do you, how do you work with, in a genre and produce something sort of fresh and, and interesting mm -hmm. if, there's, if, if everyone else who's much smarter than you has already done it? You know? <laughs> so, no, you put a talking mammoth in it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you just go totally left field. Um, her aunt, whilst, whilst we've got you, tell us about this new job you've got and, and what it is. Oh, so I'm extremely excited because as of next week, 
I will be the inaugural CEO of Public Libraries Victoria, which is the peak body for the public library sector in the state. Um, so I joke that I'm going from readers, from writers Victoria to readers Victoria, but of course libraries are so much more than books these days. Um, I feel like I'm sort of, it's a beautiful job for me because it, it enables me to span those two passions that I have for community development and for literature and literacy and books. So it's, yeah, I'm very excited. I'm, and I get to work with librarians who are so great. Uh, that's, that's wonderful to hear, Angela. Oh, I, in my previous, one of my previous jobs, I used to work for the city of Adelaide and um, I did a lot of work with libraries and, and community centres and, and actually developing the city library in, in Adelaide, which was um, oh, fabulous. The, the, you know, well, convincing council to, to build it. So, um, yeah, I think libraries are just, uh, just such important institutions in, in our communities. So, yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Wonderful. And librarians and the are the best. Oh like, yeah, oh yeah. And I look I actually convinced um I convinced quite a prominent Australian blogger, um, Sue at Whispering Gums, to write a blog post recently about libraries in Australian literature. And I mentioned your book and said, you know, there's lots of mentions of, you know, this is a book that library lovers are gonna love. So yeah. yes, it's there. There's yeah. a bit of a queue for Pip's book at most libraries though. Yeah. I don't know if <laughs> yeah, actually someone told me today they were 150th on the list. And there yep. were 30 copies in the library. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, I've got a little library anecdote, if you like. And this is, this is really about the um, benefits of doing your research. So I had written most of the draft of the Dictionary of Lost Words. And then I had the opportunity to go and um, spend a bit more time in Oxford just to double check a few things and fill a few gaps. And all the way through, I'd had the Bodleian Library as a lending library. And it wasn't until I actually joined the Bodleian Ride Library oh. as a reader that I found out that no one has ever borrowed a book from the Bodleian Library. It's, it's, it never happens. Um, not even the King of England during Edwardian times was allowed to borrow a book from the Edwardian Library. And I, I just remember thinking the entire trip, every cent I'd paid for it, was worth it for that one little piece of information because that really would have undermined the entire, <laughs> the entire book for anyone that, you know, lived in Oxford and knew that. Um, we've got a, we're coming towards the end. We've got a few um, comments and questions. Um, I've got one here from Vicky Daddo for you, Pip, saying, how do you reconcile the almost ironic notion that your book might be considered and marketed as women's fiction when its themes examine women's lives in a way that demand a wider audience and have found a wider audience? Yeah, no, I totally um, have thought about that because uh, one of the things I was really, um, I was really strong about when it came to the cover that was that it didn't have a woman looking wistfully towards anything <laughs> on the cover because um, it is about more than women. I understand why it, is, it would be ca characterised as women's historical fiction because it is about a woman. Um, but I've had some really wonderful feedback from men as well about this book and I'm, I'm really glad it's finding male readers. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure there's anything you can do about books being consumed mostly by women when they're about women. Um, but I hope that they pass it on to their, their partners and sons and fathers. <laughs> the whole idea of women's, women's fiction is kind of absurd to me. Um, um, you know, these, these questions we get in the publishing industry say, oh, how do you, you know, will your book appeal to female readers? Um, and I always think that's an absurd notion. I've, I've been asked it a few times. I'm like, what, you mean readers? Yes. <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's what Liz Gilbert says. She goes, you know, people say to her, "Oh, your your books are just for female readers." She goes, "No, you mean readers, because yeah. um, it's overwhelmingly women who buy and read books." So this is exactly right. Why would why, you? Why, why wouldn't you write for women? <laughs> right, that's totally, right. totally. And uh, hey. actually, um, Chris, just interestingly, there is a word in the Oxford English Dictionary, and this is in the book, um, a word that was actually uh, in the final penultimate proof of the dictionary and then it was crossed out and this word is literately and um 
It's a word that was coined by a, a woman novelist, Mrs. Griffith. She doesn't get a first name. Everybody, everyone else in the dictionary gets a first name, but she doesn't. Um, and it was crossed out. And it simply means something that's written literately. So it's, it's written well. Um, but a word that got in on the same page that was coined by Coleridge, and it was the only example of it, was literata, which means a literary lady. <laughs> And just, just below it is the word literati, which means literate people. And so literate ladies are not included in literate people. They had to have a word <laughs> of their own. So it's a little bit the same. You're a reader or you're, you know, you know you're a female reader. Um, we're, we're coming to the end, but Pep, can you tell us about your new book, what it's called? Uh, can you tell us anything about it and what it's about? <laughs> I'm so nervous doing this because... Mm, because um, you're committing yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so I have started writing an, another book. It's called The Bookbinder of Jericho. Um, now, Jericho is actually the, the area of Oxford where the Oxford University Press is. And it's about a woman who works in the bindery. So it's a woman, she's a working class woman, she's been told that her job is to bind the books, not to read them. And her, mm -hmm. you know, her desire really, she's incredibly intelligent. She does read the books because she's got access to them, um, but it's not her place to read them. And she certainly doesn't have access to Somerville College, which is literally across the road from Oxford University Press and is one of the first women's colleges of Oxford University. Um, so, you know, the whole book really is about whether or not she gets from one side of Walton Street to the other. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Uh, I reckon you'll sell a couple of hundred copies maybe of that, you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. 180. Looking forward, to, looking forward to that one. <laughs> well, um, I'm looking forward to writing it. So, you know, <laughs> how we go. That's the thing. You get asked in these events, like, um, what are you working on next? As if you haven't just spent years, you know, writing a book. I've, I've been asked in a few interviews, what am I working on next? And I foolishly sort of outlined it and now I'm stuffed because I feel like I have to do it. Yeah, well, that's exactly what you've just asked me to do, Chris. So, mm, so right. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the Bookbinder of Jericho, out uh, February 2023. <laughs> 22, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming along and listening to us chat tonight. You've been listening to me, Chris Flint, um, presenting Angela Savage and Pip Williams. Um, the, their books are available if you're a local person down here uh, in Gippsland or Bass Coast. Their books are available to buy at Lois's bookstore, Turn the Page and Cows. Um, thank you, Ange, and thank you, Pip. I'm going to throw back to Lois now if you want to say cheerio and she'll, she'll wind up. Or, well, anyway, thank you both for... Thank you. And can I, and also, can I say thank you? Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Angela. And just a little plug for your book, Chris. I read it recently and it's, it's an absolute joy. I loved it so much. So, you know, it's, I think there are three it, books yeah. to go out and buy. I, I couldn't agree more. And it's such a great read at this particular moment. Yeah. It's transporting. It's funny. It's what we really need. It's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Oh, look, it's all right. <laughs> 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 and thanks to everybody who came along tonight. It's just lovely, um, you know, to have you there and, and lovely. I would, um, I'm, I'd be kidding if I didn't say I'd much rather be on Phillip Island tonight. But uh, since we can't be there, thank you so much for enabling this to happen and for coming yeah. along. Thank thanks, you. Chris. Thanks. Lois? Okay. Um, thank you to everyone. Um, it's been an absolutely wonderful session and we're getting some fantastic comments here. So if you want to just um, put a comment down there before we uh, close off, but thank you to both um, Pip and Angela. Um, I, Angela, it's really, um, sorry, Pip. Um, my mum used to read the dictionary for leisure. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you could open the dictionary and ask her a word and she knew the meaning of it which was oh. quite extraordinary um, so I've grown up with dictionaries <laughs> and um, they're one of my favourite things so um, and your book was just so delicious with all the words 
and the way that you um, develop them. So it was fabulous. So, um, and thank you, Angela. I haven't got to your book yet, but <laughs> as you could probably understand, I've got a lot of books, but I'll get to it very soon. And thank you for your time as well. And thank you, Chris. Exactly. That was absolutely fantastic. What a great discussion. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we're all done and we can actually just sign off now. And, and um, Ang um, Angela, I hope to see you over here sometime. Love to. Yeah. I'll come visit the library. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We've got lovely librarians here. And um, Pip, um, it'd be lovely to see you here as well sometime. Oh, I can't, I can't wait. And, and just um, a big, a big, you know, heartfelt, good on you victoria for um yeah for just doing the hard yards in the last couple of months it's just been um dreadful but also the rest of the country is grateful so yeah we've worked hard and uh, we're getting there and we wow. will we will win yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you everyone and uh good night good night thank you, thank you. thanks guys Bye. thank you <laughs>